would like to welcome Amanda and let's give her all kinds of love and a warm welcome and extra prayers. She's getting over a cold and but she's going to be here and slay it. So thank you. Thank you, lovely lady. What a lovely introduction. I feel very loved and wanted and uh, very safe in this space. And it's such a beautiful privilege to come here and share on my favorite topic, which is self-love. And, um, and it's taken many years to get to a stage where I really feel like I can say, I love myself, I am enough. I am valued, I deserve love, you know, and we have so much of that, you know, in our literature where it talks about loving thyself, you know, and, um, and it, you know, I didn't come here with that intention. I came here because of my issues with relationships. I came here because when relationships ended, I wanted to die. I wanted to kill myself. I had this pain that was a physical, emotional, spiritual pain that I didn't hear people talking about in recovery. And I was like, what is this thing? Um, and I came from another fellowship and I'd had 10 years years in another fellowship when my codependency had just chugged along in fact it had been fueled by the messages in that other fellowship and I would just served others to an extent and I got here when I was um, 10 years clean and I was burnt out from giving away everything and um, and I know that's many other people's experiences you know I think as codependents we are incredibly loving, kind, generous hearted people where our beautiful aspects of our personality have been blown out of proportion. And I really understand that now. I really have a clear view after being in this fellowship for a number of years, doing the work, peeling back the layers of the onion, I get to see who I am and what the true essence of my spirit is. And uh, and I, you know, and it's taken me many years to acknowledge the damage, you know, that was done to me. And, um, and I think this is what the layers of the onion for me are all about, about coming here and having so much denial around my childhood, around my caregivers, around the impact it had on how I grew up how I saw myself and how I operated in life. And what CODA has done is it, for the first time, it made me really uh, be present and stop, you know, pre-CODA, I was just so busy. I was like, my trauma response is fight flight. And I'm just, all I've done since I stopped using drugs was just be busy, but busy, 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 busy. And I never stopped. I never stopped. I didn't even, I didn't even allow myself time to breathe properly. You know, I was always in this survivor's breath. I was always in this, you know, shallow breathing. And it wasn't till I got to CODA that I actually started to think I need to slow down. I need to let my higher power in. And there was all this stuff that I just didn't seem to recover from in other fellowships. And, and the main thing was self-hatred. You know, even today, when I look on look at my and see my face on Zoom, I have a little bit of like, oh, I'm getting older, but I just don't have that. Um, I mean, I'm very glad that when I first started coming to meetings, it wasn't on Zoom because I don't think I'd be able to look at myself. You know, and my self-hatred was to the degree where I would literally, I couldn't look at pictures of myself. I was revolted about what I saw, you know, and, and the thing was now when I look at pictures of myself, I've actually changed in the way that I've been photographed because of learning to love myself. When I look at a picture of myself, I now have this shiny, happy face because the love is coming out of my heart outwards into that picture whereas before the self-hatred would show up in that picture and I'd always pull weird faces and that really um out of everything I've done in recovery to love myself has been the longest hardest journey you know and if you're new to this fellowship just keep coming you know this fellowship our promises our pro and, and you know many of our promises talk about what you're going to get here which is that you are going to feel loved you're going to feel lovable you are going to get healthy relationships and I 
you know, and I just didn't believe that. My story is that I'd had very unhealthy relationships and, and all the characteristics of codependency were so they just were in me I was controlling I was you know controlling to the degree where it was just rampant in my life and I also was um incredibly bad at giving advice to other people I always thought I needed to tell people what to do I thought they couldn't manage without my advice <laughs> you know now I realize it was that was just such a arrogant thing for me to think that I knew what other people needed but now I get it now I I understand, um, you know, how really it's just about my biggest job is just to look after me. And in fact, that's the most important job, you know, learning to look after myself and learning to nourish my body, my spirit, you know, to learning to just be within myself and not avoid and not distract by looking after others has been the journey for me and Coda. I was on the run from the damage. I was on the run from my childhood trauma. I was on the run from what happened to me as a little girl. And I didn't know it. You know, Coda, it's funny because I was in therapy for 10 years before I came to Coda. I came to Coda at 11 years clean. And you know what? The work I've done here has been so much more revolutionary than any work I did with a therapist. This program has given me the ability, first of all, just to be able to communicate I couldn't the people pleasing in me was so it kept me so imprisoned I wasn't honest in any relationship in my life because I was so worried about everybody leaving me so I you know I couldn't really be honest about stuff because I thought if I upset people they're all going to walk away so I had this uh you know none of my relationships were really that honest you know because of the codependency I was in chains around um you know, my communication, my levels of honesty. I was around people that on a level, you know, I was around a lot of people that used me because I had this giving kind nature. And, and what I didn't realize was that I attracted people that needed to be looked after. And it fed my codependency because I was like, oh, this needs to be needed. I can look after you, I can sort your life out. So I, I had all these people in my life that I was supporting. And yet I never, ever got vulnerable and asked for help myself. And this fellowship is the fellowship that absolutely made me really say, I can't do this. I need a miracle. I need to, I need something from outside of myself to change how I feel within, within my own body. And that disease, that, that feeling of being uncomfortable in my skin, looking at myself, hating myself, hearing the sound of my own voice would be like, it would be revolting. And, um, you know, and I never believed that stuff would change. I'd had that stuff. I remember as a teenager, really, really, you know, I remember being at school and all my friends started to have relationships and I just felt like I was grotesque. I felt like I had nine alien heads, you know, and that was pre-addiction it was like there is something wrong with me I am wrong I am absolutely wrong there is nothing about the way I look that is right you know and this level of and this is the thing I've come to this fellowship and through CODA and it's like being a research project what I've done is I've come to this fellowship I've listened I've got involved I've done service and also I've been on a journey to find out why I hated myself where this self-hatred came from and and uh, and I've read lots of books you know around codependency, around trauma, you know, and I, I always had this thing because I was brought up in this middle-class family with nice clothes, I was privately educated, that everything was okay. And it took me, what I understand is that codependency, we have so much denial. I had so much denial over what happened to me as a little girl. And both my parents are um, drinkers and they're like functioning alcoholics. They, you know, they drink in a very middle-class way at six o'clock every day. They both get absolutely pissed out of their heads and and they'd come from uh, a family systems that were also alcoholic systems so I'd come from two generations both my grannies died from alcoholism and uh, through through the family systems what was passed down 
was this dysfunction of parenting that meant that I didn't receive what I needed as a little girl, you know, and I have to be honest, I wasn't battered, I wasn't sexually abused, you know, I, I wasn't punched, I wasn't, so because of, I didn't get any of those uh, obvious signs of abuse, I just thought my childhood was fine. And it wasn't until I came to this fellowship and started to unearth what a healthy child needs and and series of you know development the theory of attachment what how a baby needs to be mirrored how a baby needs to be validated and affirmed and loved and given connection and I know with my family you know my mum just didn't she'd never been taught she didn't know how to she was much more interested in her glass of wine and her cigarettes than, than holding her baby, you know. And, and what happened was uh, in England, we had a very Victorian, in middle classes, it was like the children would live in a separate part of the house, you know, and they wouldn't be seen or not heard, you know, and the nanny would look after them and then the parents would be in their lounge. And that was literally my experience. Uh, you know, I, I, was, I did have a nanny, I think. I don't think mum was that present for me when I was born. Her mum was dying and, uh, um, and and I went on to have a very solitary upbringing. You know, I I remember having this amazing sort of imagination and spending most of my child childhood in my head with this imagination, and that's what kept me safe. You know, in my reality was that I had two parents that drank every day, that didn't know how to bring up a young child, and uh, and because of that, you know there was a lot of emotional neglect and that emotional neglect and this is what I found out through CODA that the emotional neglect is where the damage comes from when children are not given the love that they need you know and it's not about money or clothes I had all the material trappings of a beautiful home you know I had a there was a horse in the garden there was do you know what I mean? Acres of land, there was beautiful clothes, there was, you know, and none of that was important. What I needed was to be held, to be, you know, taught how to communicate, to, to be taught that human connection soothes. That's the thing that I wasn't taught. You know, I wasn't ever... Um, I just wasn't given love. I wasn't given love and I wasn't... That, that lack of connection, that lack of human bond, uh, you know, in my first six months of life and even uh, in, my, uh, ad, in my toddler years, you know, it was nothing. I was just literally put in a bedroom and left. And, uh, and I think I stayed in my bedroom up to the age of about 13, 14. So I was left and I always remember I've heard someone saying it was like growing up in the wilderness. And it was like that. It was like growing up in a big forest with no with nothing, with no, like, how do I do this? And I remember being a teenager and having this self-hatred and, and, and I'm really not, you know, trying to work it out, trying to, trying to play these roles, trying to like, oh yeah, I know how I should react to that because I didn't know how to manage emotions. I didn't know how to communicate and I didn't know how to, I definitely knew I didn't like myself. And, and that level of self-loathing just grew and grew and grew. And, um, you know, and I went into addiction because of that. I see that as my, uh, you know, it was like my prime, my catalyst really to use. And, uh, and then I got clean at 31 and, uh, and then I came to the fellowship when I was, this fellowship when I was 41. And uh, I do believe if I hadn't have come to CODA, I definitely would have, I would have either killed myself with the pain of breakup of relationships, or I would have had a breakdown. I was sort of on the verge of a breakdown because I was so busy and so focused on looking for others. And, and this fellowship made me stop in my tracks. It made me realize that I had to start putting myself first. And if you're new to CODA, that is the biggest learning curve. You know, I was taught that actually you never talk about yourself you you always asked how other people were uh, you were always there as a woman to serve others 
uh, to make sure everybody's okay. And I've now learned through CODA that the most important job is to look after me and, and to learn how to look after me and to manage myself before I can look after other people. And, uh, you know, and I came here and I started to change things in my life, external things. I started to avoid the toxic people. You know, I didn't want to be around people that abused me anymore. And, uh, and I knew that was part of the self-love journey. You know, for me to love myself, I've got to start to be around people that start to reflect, I am enough and I'm a good person. And that unconditional love, you know, you are okay, however you are, you know. And, uh, and the other thing that I had difficulty, and I still do really, is getting vulnerable, you know, really bearing my soul and, and admitting I need help goes against when you're brought up in a family where there is no love and there is no con connection and your uh, caregivers are unstable and always shifting emotionally I think it's you know I have really big trust issues so I've never been able to really be really vulnerable because I found it I couldn't cry in meetings I couldn't let my let myself let that guard down and in CODA I think this has been the melting the melting of my heart that was imprisoned with these walls because of the damage and and the walls have melted here you know I if you're new you know since I've been in this fellowship I've I've shed tears of grief and sadness for my little girl you know my little girl that sat in that bedroom on her own for a number of years unloved uncared for you know wanting desperately more than anything her parents to love her and, and I feel that when I see a little child with their mom or their dad and maybe they're a toddler and I look at the way mum will stroke her hair and stroke her face and you know maybe maybe baby's upset I get this big pang in my heart and I feel that loss because I know, I now know, even with my parents today, there's no, that my mom doesn't have it. She doesn't know how to do that. She doesn't know how to soothe. She was never soothed. And what I understand, and this is the crucial bit, guys, that self-hatred came from there, the way I was treated, what happened was I started to do that to myself. You know, this is the nature of trauma, how trauma, um, you know, we get damaged. I got damaged as a little girl and I was neglected by my caregivers. And then what happened was this voice in my head, I was trying to make myself perfect for them. And then this voice appeared, this inner critic. And I think I remember the inner critic from about the age of nine or ten. You know, I remember this monologue of you're not pretty enough. You're not good enough. You're not going to. They don't love you. Everybody hates you. You know, I mean, it's just and that voice has been with me all my life, you know, all my life. And then when I came to CODA, I started to learn and I started to read books about what emotional neglect does. And I started to understand that I was this little child caught in the crossfire of two parents in addiction and being caught in the crossfire is what did the damage. And I went on to damage myself. That inner critic was the, the continuation of the damage that was done to me. And so I knew that my main job here was to, you know, this abandonment pain that I felt at the end of relationships. That's why I came here. I came here with snot coming out my nose. Every time a relationship ended, I was like, I'm going to kill myself. And I didn't do the work until I got to 10 years clean here. And then I came, I did the step work. And that for me was the beginning of my journey. I do not believe this program works unless you put pen to paper, unless you attend CODA meetings regularly. And, and then the miracle happened happens then the glasses then the code of glasses come on and I saw my life I saw this years years of avoiding here of avoiding the pain the abandonment pain of what happened to me and to and the hating of myself and I knew I wanted to change it I knew I didn't want to carry on with this monologue of self depreciating you know the critic that just I wanted to change that so that was my thing and and what I've done since I've got here is I've just I started reading books all about self-love. Any author, you know, I read Coda literature. I read lots of books that weren't Coda literature. And all of that added to my journey of what I needed to do to, 
to change this self-hatred into self-love. And the first thing I needed to do was start to knock out this powerful inner critic. And for me, that was affirmations. It was learning to just breathe in. Every time the critic would say, you're ugly, I'd look in the mirror and I'd just say, I, I put my hands on my heart and I'd just say, I love myself. I am pretty, I'm good enough. And, and really having these affirmations as a mantra, you know, just really breathing them, singing them, writing them down, writing them, putting them around your wall, whatever you need to do to to stop this, you know, this core of me that was this like this record in default that just always came back to self-hatred, self-hatred, not good enough. And uh, and the affirmations for me, were, uh, you know, I still are. I still go into places occasionally if I'm tired, if I'm ill, if I'm doing new stuff. Whenever I do anything new, the inner critic comes back. And it's very funny because I would say I've been in Coda 11 years and I would say the inner critic for me at around three or four years got a lot quieter you know I started to work the steps I've worked the steps in a step group uh, and and my friends that I work at my little peers that I'm in a step group now we all have a lot of years in recovery in, in the other fellowship but we've all realized that this is our this is our core this is our core stuff coda for me is the core of the onion it's unlocking all the childhood trauma and releasing those stories releasing the story that i'm not lovable you know and for me my name amanda a means worthy of love and i you know and isn't it it's isn't it ironic that i spent you know, nearly 50 years of my life hating, hating on myself. And this program has enabled me to, to change that, to flip that. And it's not a, you know, if you're new and you still have this inner critic, you know, it, what I can promise you, and I would promise you with all the money in my bank account, and I have quite a lot of savings, you know, I've, I've saved a lot of, and I would say to you that if you have done five years in code, you've done lots of steps, lots of meetings, lots of shares, lots of recovery stuff, read lots of literature, the inner critic will get quieter. And then if you keep going and doing another five years, you know, I'm 11 years, 12, coming up for 12 years in CODA, and the critic is gone, gone. That voice, that self-hatred, that horrible, nasty, demeaning voice that said things has entirely gone from my from my psyche you know I've rewritten the script and and also I've done it by you know removing those people removing the people who lowered my self-esteem you know the I've uh, all the friends I have in my life now are beautifully non-abusive loving people that have open hearts they accept me for who I am and that was the thing with my family of origin I'm still I'm still not accepted. You know, my family of origin are really damaged little bunnies. My mom's still very damaged. My dad's, you know, and, uh, and the messages I get from them are still not good. You know, they still think I'm not enough or I'm not right. And, and I have to minimize my time. I do have contact with my mum and my dad but I minimize the time and I come back to the fellowship to to get my you know to get my people to be in the gang to get my support to know that I'm all right and I understand that they are a really big part of the problem but I you know and I have had periods where I didn't contact my family uh to get well in CODA you know and I think it is really important when we're early in CODA to build that foundation to to maybe just um you know if if you have family members that are like mine in active addiction to stay away and to and to start to build this self-esteem and self-esteem is a, our perception of ourself and and I know through my upbringing that was so distorted and what's beautiful about CODA is our perspective and the filter shifts you know this filter that told me everybody hated me has now gone you know I start to realize that most human beings are loving creatures and uh, harnessing self-love means that I've had to learn how to look after this body, this vessel for my spirit, you know, and I'd never did that. I Self-care was something I never did pre-CODA. I, I didn't know how to nourish myself. I didn't know, all I knew how to do was push myself hard, whether it be physically, emotionally, at work, you know, just giving, doing, working, you know, even in the gym, I would do, 
two, three classes a day. I just, you know, had this drive and it was this, I'm not enough, I'm not enough, I'm not enough, churning away in an engine inside me, pushing me to go harder. And I, I don't have that today. You know, I've stopped pushing myself. I've started to listen to my body for the first time in my life. I understand that my body is a, you know, I'm in menopause, I'm a menopausal woman, I'm a lunatic, ladies, you know, you know, I'm like angry, reactive, you know and and yet I've learned to love myself through the last couple of years where emotionally I've been up against it you know I've been up against those raging hormones and uh and I've I've loved myself through my ups and downs through my angry outbursts and that's the thing with self-love where once we get self-love it means that we can really start to embrace ourselves no matter what state we're in whether we're crying whether we're angry whether we're being reactive I don't batter myself anymore when I make mistakes I just go oh that's all right you just made a mistake it's okay you know because I understand that uh, berating myself and and having a go at myself for doing things wrong is what was done to me as a child it was not my issue and that's the thing with self-hatred it was like this was my parents issue it wasn't my issue and yet because of the damage they did to me I end up destroying myself so that ironic sort of like twisted thing and once you understand that you really really I've made a concerted effort to just not destroy myself anymore so the damage has stopped what happened to my parents it happened to them as well and you know and in the coda journey I've actually sat with my mom and said my parenting was not okay you know I'd done the step eight and nine of eight and nine process with them in my other recovery journey but I had never sat down my little girl wanted to stay and I kept having dreams about it and I sat down with my mum I was 18 years clean and I said mum you know what I've got to tell you being put in my bedroom as a little girl and left on my own was not okay and that was most probably the one of the bravest conversations I've ever had in my life um, and I said I'm not doing it to have a go at you I'm not doing it to be I just need to say that for little Amanda and it was like that was like really powerful for me and my mind said I'm saying it just and she said Amanda you know what I just did what had been done to me and I got it you know and that level of forgiveness for my parents it's taken me years to, to get over the anger of you know that anger that I had within me was equivalent to the damage that was done and it had to come out in Coda you know I believe this process is we have to go through all of the layers of the damage the anger the neglect to reach that point of loss to reach that point of sadness to reach the point of connecting my inner child says you know she just wanted to be loved and she didn't get that and I'm now at that point where I fully forgive my parents both of them for what they did you know but it didn't come it wasn't like I came to code I didn't even think I needed to forgive them for anything I had to uncover all of that childhood stuff first to learn to go through it to emotionally release it in the rooms of coda you know to hear other people and then oh and then that would tap into that and then I'd feel this feeling you know and it's it's funny I think the process the way meetings work that for a lot of my journey I when I tell my story I don't connect but when I hear other people telling my story then I feel the pain then I connect with my story and that's why this fellowship has been so beautiful for me to come to have somewhere where we talk about the family of origin stuff where I get the identification I don't have this perfect mum and dad at Christmas time I hate it because of all the connotations of Christmas and happy families that I've never felt but in Coda I found this family I found this family of men and women who taught my language who show me it's okay to rock up just as I am and know that I am loved I am loved by my higher power I'm loved by my friends in Coda and I've learned to love myself you know and that inner journey forget all the outer relationships because the Coda journey more importantly is about going inwards and starting to feel this love within my spirit within my soul for me 
to say, I'm okay, I'm okay. I'm not this person with mutant alien heads. I'm a person that has love. I'm a person that can be kind, can be generous. You know, I can do all these things for others, but I can still remain in myself and know how to look after myself. And 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 the steps for Coda in Coda have just been a beautiful coming home. You know, I feel like it's a load of surrenders to come home, to come home, to reside in my spirit, in my soul, and know I'm okay. And that's um, that's what we do here. You know, and 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 I never, you know, I remember it two years in Coda, and I'd read those promises and I would think I'm never going to reach a point where I feel lovable or I'm never going to reach a point where I have equal relationships in my life and those promises when I read them I strive for them I still strive for them you know it's, it takes really it took me a lot of years to change the thing of when I'm on a phone call with someone to let them say to me how are you and then for me to say, oh, actually, I'm not OK, you know, because I'd been had so many years of being a chronic codependent where I would just say, how are you? And I keep asking questions. So there was no room for me. You know, self-love is the most beautiful journey because on that journey, we start to see ourselves for who we are. And I never I never envisaged that I would feel as comfortable as I do in my own skin. And it gives me the ability in all the arenas of my life, in my relationships, in my work, in, in every arena, I can show up for myself and everything works when I love myself. Self-love is like the ingredient to my primary relationship with my partner. You know, I always thought that, you know, I had to put the relationship first and now I realize when I look after me, the relationship will be okay. You know, in terms of my work and starting to say to people, actually, I'm worth more than that. I, I believe that I'm worth more, you know, my self-esteem has grown. So in terms of my work, I do less work for more money because I believe in myself you know and that self-love in terms of all my relationships just not allowing myself to be in any relationships where people put me down where they're you know because there is there's you know people what I realized was there's these subliminal abuse that I still had in my life of people that were covert abusive people and it would just be little comments or little passive aggressive digs and Coda gave me all this knowledge about the, all these other ways of communicating and and um, and because of that I've sort of my world got smaller in Coda but what's happened is the friends that I've got reflect back who I am and where I'm at, which is I'm a loving being. Or, you know, what I know in life is love makes everything work, you know, and love is what I've most wanted. And love has been the thing that I couldn't get because of my damage, because I pushed it away and I sabotaged. And the more I've learned to self-love, the less, the more those sabotaging behaviours that I had within my codependency have diminished 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 and the, the last few years I've really worked on uh, the outer critic you know I did a lot of I got rid of the inner critic and I started to love myself and then I did a lot of pushing my partner away a lot of outer critic judging her you know making it all her fault and over the last couple of years that stuff's got better as well you know I've really and that step three prayer it's such a beautiful prayer you know that prayer for me is the one where I know all my wounds can be healed I didn't believe that you know I when I uncovered all this trauma stuff you know I read all these books and I was like oh I'm never going to change you know and I boxed myself off and I thought I'm never going to and what I believe in is the magic the magic of our step six and seven that this stuff can go and and over the last couple of years it's got better my partner and I've got so much closer this year we've just had another we've sort of fallen back in love again you know and that's because my defects all that were connected to my self-hatred and my sabotage and some of them have gone again you know and we're in this period of grace where we feel really loved up you know and that is coda as well you know because all I've wanted guys all I've wanted in my life is to be held and be loved and feel it you know and and because of my codependency the sabotage would you know I just would always not feel it you know and I feel like now I'm getting to the point where 
the fruition of all my work in this fellowship is coming real, you know, and, and the love is coming, the sabotage behaviors are going down, you know, and, and I would say to you, if you are, if you are like me and you came to this fellowship and you hated yourself, just believe, believe in the miracle of Codependence Anonymous. It can change. You will love it. You will love yourself and you will get all my savings if you don't. You can come and find me, Amanda M in London. I'm quite well known in code. Find me on Facebook, you know, and you can say, Oi, give me your say, because I believe in what we do here. I this this the program, the steps, it's all about love. You know, it's all about learning to go within, face our story, stop running, you know, and, and heal that damage. So I'm going to leave it there because I've got I've got this fluey cold thing and I feel a little bit um, under the weather. And I lovely to hear you all back and hear you share back with me. So um, great to be here. Thank you so much, the Arizona, Arizona crew. It's such a privilege and honor to come here and share about the most phenomenal change in my life due to being in this fellowship so thank you for letting me share lovely lovely committee people and loads of love and big hugs to everybody around the world